22. Luke 22 and verse 15. I'll read verse 15 and 16. It says in Luke 22, verse 15, And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, it can be a little bit challenging, really, to put all the pieces together. When it uh, comes to why Christ came as he did, and then everything that transpired in his life, and his sacrifice, and his resurrection, and what is to come, it is an involved story. It's not complicated, but it is involved, and there are different parts to it. I think that sometimes, if we look at it too quickly, or too casually, we can miss a lot. We can miss the, the, the richness of it. We'll take a, a look at a couple of different points in that regard uh, during this time. Putting all those pieces together brings him home to us like nothing else will, if we can put all those pieces together. One thing that, there's one act that took place during this Passover meal described in Luke 22, and also that we'll look at in Matthew 26 with a communion passage. That Passover meal, there's one aspect of that story that maybe you might not have considered, and we'll look at it, and it makes it very, very uh, rich, I think. We'll share in uh, the Lord's Supper, of course, but first we look uh, at it a little bit differently and hopefully have a greater appreciation of it and why, in connection to that, we celebrate this time of year. So much of Jesus' ministry centered on the family. It really did. It centered on the family. Much of God's Word talks about the family structure. He talked about families at length, and ultimately he said that he would be our family and would offer us a new ancestry and would offer us a new heritage. Whatever your background is, it's irrelevant now. Your background, your ancestry, because we've been grafted in, is the family of God. That's our ancestry. You know, and I think probably in most cases that's a, that's a pretty good thing to realize that. Because sometimes the, the past or what's gone on in the past is not all that great. Christ came along and he changed all that and he said, I'm going to graft you in. This is your family tree now. That was his purpose. His entry into the world changed the equation of how everything would be done. He didn't change anything about the law. He was to change the way that it was to be lived, to show effectively how it would be lived. We can become better at living it if we can become better at connecting it into our way of doing things the way of our own lives. And that's important. Most people don't make that connection. They think about Jesus, they think about the God's Word, they think, yeah, you know, that's great, there's some uh, good truths in there, they treat it like a philosophy that never really takes any root in their own life. The Passover, the Lord's Supper, was the first and the last, for he who is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. We must never lose sight of the fact that in no way did Jesus ever violate the law of God. As a matter of fact, showing that it could be lived was a central reason for his appearance showing that it could be lived, that it was possible. Not just possible, that it was plausible. Not just plausible, that we have to consider to be inevitable. I believe that one of the reasons that Christ came was to, in the eyes of the world, and really even in the religious leadership, was to redeem the reputation of the Father. To do that, as I mentioned this morning, he made himself of no reputation. But he was going to show, because the world and even the religious leadership had made it almost impossible to, to live for God. And he came to show that God's plan does work. I think it was the priority aspect of his mission. Much of the church has fallen prey to the notion that that which is contained in the law of the Old Testament was somehow incomplete. It wasn't, and it isn't. But we could study exclusively the Old Testament, I'm convinced, and fully understand and even participate in the redemptive message of God, the salvation of God, God's plan is contained in every aspect of Scripture. So it was a system that would end with a final sacrifice. It was a system of conduct that worked, but even with the clarity that that system provided for people and how that they lived, man could still not follow through on it. It wasn't that it wasn't possible, because the Holy Spirit has always been active in helping those that want to serve God. It was a functional means for man to have a relationship with God, a sacrificial system. But it seemed as if it was a plan that was incomplete, and it was. And in some people's uh, way of thinking, it seemed to be a, 
system that had failed and it didn't. We look at the Old Testament as kind of a plan one, since that was a, a, a failure in some people's eyes. As I said, it wasn't. The New Testament was plan two. It was man that failed, not God's plan at any point. Christ came to fulfill the law of God with the statement of his life and the giving of his life. You know, it must have been extremely important for him to demonstrate that God's plan would work or else he wouldn't have lived here for 32, 33 years. He could have just appeared and said, I'm God, I'm going to be sacrificed for your sins. But he stayed and he demonstrated. And we can see that the vast majority of his time spent in this world was a demonstration of how God's plan is to be lived. He came to redeem God's plan by showing that it had always, always been a workable system, but that man was unreceptive to his possibilities. The shepherds that would have been watching the sheep that night of Jesus' birth were no ordinary shepherds. You know, a lot of people struggle with the concept, well, you know, we celebrate the birth of Christ in December, and it couldn't have possibly taken place in December. That's not true. Some would say, well, sheep wouldn't normally be out in the middle of winter. They would have been stabled or sheltered somewhere else. That's not true either. It would have been unusual for the shepherds and sheep to be in the field at this time of year, but these were known regular sheep and these were no regular shepherds. The winter months in Judah were days of nearly constant pounding, drenching rain. And at the higher elevations, there would be an ample amount of snow. And in a couple of different mountains in that area, there was snow on those mountains all the time. We can kind of relate to that, right? The sacrifice of the temple went on year round. So the sheep had to be maintained for this purpose. These sheep were the honored flock. You've heard me use this term before. They were the tower of the flock. The Migdal Eder, the tower of the flock. The sheep to be sacrificed in the temple. So at least weren't sheep that were merely meant uh, to be fed and nurtured for their wool. These were sheep that were raised specifically for sacrificing in the temple and they had to be of the highest quality possible. As much as is possible without blemish. When the shepherds left to find Mary and Joseph and Jesus, Luke 2, verses 15 and 16, they would have taken the sheep with them rather than just let them wander. They were too important for that. These sheep had to be kept. They couldn't be blemished or suffer a broken bone. So the shepherd would have kept them, the shepherds would have kept them very, very close. It would be these sacrificial sheep, you think about that setting, that would have been surrounding and milling around the birthplace of Jesus. These sheep that were to be sacrificed. Everyone trying to stay out of what might have been a very wet, and cold night, it probably was. And we often depict the manger scene as being almost pristine, don't we? You know, and it, it's kind of, it's a bright place. You know, we've got a, a manger scene with Joseph and Mary, uh, you know, up against our fence and it's all lit up and it's very pretty and everything. I doubt it was that way. It probably would have been uh, better if we, maybe we could have a, have a, a sprinkler or, or something over it so it could just be a downpour. It was probably a downpour. <laughs> No one else might have been aware of it, but God knew that with the entry of the Lamb of God, these sheep would no longer have to be sacrificed with the entry of the Lamb of God. They would be up until the final sacrifice being made. It's not easy, but every sermon or Sunday school lesson or Bible study is a plea for you to use your imagination. Right, to use your creativity, to put yourself in a place that you can clearly see the heart and the mind of God. You've got to put yourself there. It's like I was using the illustration of the child today, and the child totally out of control, totally disobedient, totally rebellious, and I said, that's us. Oh yeah, that's us. You know what it is, as we get older, we learn to disguise it more effectively. And we do it in much more subtle ways. Hopefully as a believer in Jesus Christ, you say, I'm done with that. 
I'm not doing that anymore. You know, it doesn't mean you're perfect, but none of us are, but you understand what I'm saying. Albert Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge. And we get too caught up in the realities of life and fail to see what might be. And the realities of life are sometimes uh, designed just for that. They're, they're pressures on us. And we lose sight of what could be. Like when, you know, how many of you believe that when you come to church you get a gift? Right? You believe that? You believe that? You get a gift. You get a gift. And it's more than what you could ever hope for. The world of imagination has no limits. And I'll explain that in just a moment. Here's an imagination moment for you. I ask you to take yourself from the setting of the manger forward 32, 33 years to the Lord's Supper. We read about it in Luke 22. Creativity is a way of life. It's an attitude toward living. There were so many times with problems come up. I think it was also Einstein that said that we deal with problems in the same way. We use the same words. We harp on the same subjects. And we expect things to turn out all right after doing the same thing for 50 times. And he also said, that's insanity. And very often my prayer is, Lord, show me a different way to approach this problem. Give me insight so that I can come at this, so that I can help this individual in a different way that I hadn't thought of before. And that's going to take some imagination and creativity. And so I think about it, and I rely on the Holy Spirit to lead me in that. I don't know that it's uh, in the aspect of probably the Holy Spirit has to get creative in opening my eyes to it. Probably you too as, uh, as well, but as a creator of the universe, it would only make sense that God would institute a vivid creativity in each of us. In fact, it may be the only way that we can truly grasp the scope and meaning of God's plan. It becomes clear <laughs> that God used his creativity to put countless messages and nuances through the pages of God's Word. That's an important thing to do. You know, I think that probably most of you are, are fairly adept at studying God's Word, and you've got to do that on, you've got to do that at least on a monthly basis, right? You've got to go into God's Word and read it at least once a month. Right? You know what that means? You're going to be in trouble about 29 days out of the month, if that's all you do. So do it once a week. Right? I mean, you're doing it now, right? You came here. I mean, think about it. You opened up the Bible twice today. At least. Maybe three times, including Sunday school. You're in trouble if you don't do it more than that. I can guarantee you. You're going to be confused and befuddled if you don't do it more than that. There was a lot of people that... Was like, I think of a couple of individuals, but over the years, probably actually more than that, but they take uh, the mentality that well, if I get in trouble, then I rely on the pastor to tell me what I need to do. You better hope I never miss. You better hope that I never have any ulterior motives. You know, when we start to rely on individuals like that, then every individual is fallible. We start to rely on individuals like that, we will quickly be misled. That's, that's called the beginnings of a cult. So we rely on God's Word. So we've got to get into God's Word every day. You're thinking, well, no, I'm not really a reader. Now that may be, but we've got to get into God's Word because it's more than just something to read. It's a story about His life. It's about how He brings us into His family, and that's one of the reasons that He came. If we can see these different messages and nuances in the Word, we can see how the first Passover, Exodus 12, is so illustrative of the life of Christ. We've talked about it several different times there. It had to be a very personal event, and it was. All of the lamb had to be consumed after it had been observed. It couldn't be a lamb, the lamb, it had to be your lamb. And then once you determine that it was a lamb without blemish after uh, observing it for a specific amount of time, then it was all to be consumed during that Passover. And so to that we can connect the tower of the flock milling around the birthplace of Jesus, the Lamb of God. And we can take ourselves to that room where Jesus spent his last hours with his family, his disciples. 
from here, we enter into a little bit of speculation, but not really, not too much. Nothing to violate the message of the Holy Writ. Since that first Passover in Exodus 12, you can read it, it's described there, but in that first uh, Passover there in Exodus, it was the head of a household that would sacrifice the lamb as instructed to do so in verse 6 of that powerful chapter. So it was the head of a household that would sacrifice that lamb. The tradition was that the Passover was to be shared in groups of 10 or more. So Jesus and his disciples would have fit that model. And as I said, he considered them to be his family. So they're there in this family setting at that Passover, and we're relating it to the first Passover, to the Passover that's described in Matthew 26 and also in Luke chapter 22. Nowhere else in the Gospels is it suggested that Jesus ever offered a sacrifice. But I can guarantee you that as head of this group, it would have fallen to him to make the sacrifice for the Passover meal. It would be very much like him to lead in complying with every aspect of the law. Every aspect of the law. The first, the last, and the only sacrifice, as far as we know, which Jesus offered, was the one in which symbolically he offered a <coughs> He knew that this was not what the Father truly wanted. We talked about it this morning in Hebrews and in Psalms. And he knew that it wasn't really what man truly needed. The Father and man needed a once and for all sacrifice that could bring the matter to a proper conclusion. Exodus uh, chapter 3 makes it clear that God is very aware of what his people are going through. He knows. You don't have to worry that, oh, you know, he's disassociated from what's going on in this world or even in my life or he's too big to be concerned with my trivial problems. No, he's not. Verse 7 in Exodus 3 says that he has seen he has heard, and he knows of the need that we have. He knows in specific what your need is, Exodus 3, verse 7. Seeing the need, he responds. He came down to bring us up, verse 8 in Exodus 3. He saw the oppression, verse 9, and he sent a solution himself, verse 10. There would be a first lamb slain, Exodus 12, verses 1 through 6. There would also be a last lamb slain in Luke 22, and at verse 15, this Passover, before he says he was suffering, we were going to suffer. Can you use your imagination, I don't think you have to too much, but to see the Son of God offering this Passover sacrifice himself? Can you see him doing that, taking a sheep and actually sacrificing a sheep for this Passover meal? Would have been his responsibility to the head of the family. You know, as our dog Cody got uh, older and he started to lose his senses more, his hearing and his eyesight and his sense of smell, which would have just been devastating. It'd be devastating for a dog. So I would uh, get down by his ear and I would whisper his name to him. Can you see Jesus doing that with the sheep? Saying, you're not going to be the last sacrifice, but I will be. In this context, he could have said, you're the last one necessary, but there's one more to come. You're not the last lamb slain. He might have even said, you're the next to last one that will ever be needed to be offered this way. And moments later, he that would be the last lamb required by God was going, would go his way to the cross. Use your imagination again. And if Jesus were to whisper in your ear today, what would he say? Well, there's an indication in the New Testament that the sacrificial system in one sense is still in place by people that do not adhere to the word of God. And even those that say they do and then don't crucify him daily, according to Hebrews chapter 6. He might whisper to each one of us, no more sheep need to die. Now, 
want you to live for me. It puts it uh, all in perspective, I think, doesn't it? That first Passover, the sheep around the manger, and the next to last sheep, as the Lord gave us the communion, it pulls it all together. That is how we must remember him, and is how we must anticipate him. Don't let it be just imagination, which is great, but don't let it just be something you imagine today. It's a moment for remembering and anticipating to become reality for you right now. So I'm going to ask uh, Michael and Randy if you come forward and begin to distribute the communion, if you will. lambs gathered around that birthplace where Christ was. And God telling us, I'm going to take care of the problem once and for all. No more sacrifices needed. The last lamb has been slain. The lamb of God. It says in verse 26, I'm reading from Matthew 26. Please keep in mind in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, another communion passage, it says that we need to examine ourselves. Before we take the communion, examine your heart, examine your mind, make sure that it is more, that the communion is more reality, is reality, than imaginary, as far as the function and what it means. So examine your hearts right now as I read this passage, and then we'll stand and take the communion together. And it says in Matthew 26, and in verse 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take ye, this is my body. And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. They would have been singing from the great Hillel in the Psalms, Psalm 118 in specific. So let's stand together if you would, please. I look at the setting is very much the same as when Jesus had that Passover meal that he described here in Luke chapter 22. It's the ones that were closest to him, that were family. The ones that he would commission to go and take the truth to the rest of the world. And that's what we do right now. We acknowledge his sacrifice and acknowledge that covenant. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body. Let's break the bread and take the bread together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for grafting us in by your sacrifice by making a way for your life to become a reality in us. It's real. Lord, we need to say, that's the reality I want functioning in my life. The way that you lived the way that you moved, where you went, what you did, what you said. Thank you, Lord. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let's take the cup together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you came and you redeemed every aspect of the Father's plan, and in that you redeemed us. You showed that God's plan works, always has worked, and you showed us that there's a way for it to work in our lives and to make our life more powerful, meaningful, and purposeful than ever before. Lord, I thank you for these ones here right now. They are my family, 
blessings to me. Lord, I believe that they could say that about each other, that we're blessings to each other. The first and foremost gift that you've given us during this time is yourself, and you held nothing back. You gave it all. Lord, help us to be that way with each other, to always be there for each other, to pray for each other, to be friends one to another, to cherish this time of fellowship. Lord, communion is, is just that. It is us communing first with you, but also with others that are like mind, like heart. Lord, thank you for this time that you've given us together for this day that we celebrate. Lord, may we celebrate, continue to celebrate, not just tomorrow, but even beyond that. Help us to receive this commission that you've given us. I thank you for each person here right now, Lord, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray.